Hey friends, welcome back. This is part three of three of the pamphlet from Revilo P. Oliver, doctor at an Illinois university who wrote, All America Must Know the Terror That Is Upon Us. And we are on page 10. It goes midway through page 14. So let's continue. Remember we were discussing how Dr. Oliver was talking to a professor at his uh, undergraduate university and they were talking about communism. So... Essentially, he says, that was how I first came to suspect the real orientation of communist minds, but only after years of observation and with help from the illuminating analysis by Denis de Rougemont did I realize that the young man was exper uh, exceptional only in the readiness with which he let slip the mask. The true communist, whatever disguise he may wear when he moves among you, is in the literal and exact meaning of the English word a thug, that is, a man who has made a religion of murder. He is driven by an overwhelming lust to destroy and uproot, to annihilate civilization, to kill, and even more than that, to make decent men and women suffer, to degrade them to the levels of animals. He will work constantly, tirelessly, with infinite cunning for his ideal. The day when he will drag you from your home, kick in your teeth, crack your ribs, and throw you into a slave labor camp, where he will drag out the rest of your life in a degradation that you have never imagined, even in nightmares." That is what he yearns for. Economic and social theories are merely a disguise to befuddle suckers. In 1872, when the headquarters of the International Communist Conspiracy were openly and officially transferred to New York City, there were only a few hundred people in the United States who were inspired by this bloodlust. Do you know that Hillary Clinton was one of those? Yeah, she was outwardly and actively a communist supporter. And she was a protester. And I have pictures of her and Bill in their protests, and I promise you that I will find them and I will show them to you. So the headquarters were moved to New York City in 1872, but uh, who were, there were only a few people who were inspired by this bloodlust. But they went to work patiently, doggedly, and with vicious cunning to extend their tentacles over the entire nation. They went underground. By 1876, Practically all of the members, including, of course, the new recruits, had been instructed to conceal their membership and deny that they were communists, to penetrate existing American organizations and to help one another attain positions of influence and power in those organizations. So you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. To work for the communist goal under the guise of social reform and democracy. We've heard that before, haven't we? This is, of course, the basic strategy that has been followed ever since. By 1907, the communists were strong enough to organize a wing of the party that operated openly under the leadership of a criminal named William Z. Foster. One of Foster's closest associates and advisors in 1907, or soon thereafter, was Felix Frankfurter, an immigrant who had wormed his way into the post of secretary to the Secretary of War in the cabinet of President William Howard Taft. By 1910, the first big communist cell was planted in an American university, Harvard, of course. So far as I have been able to learn, the famous cells in teacher colleges of Columbia University were not organized until somewhat later. By 1917, the communist conspiracy in the United States was strong enough directly to affect the policies of the American government. As everyone knows, the communist seizure of power in Russia was carried out by the criminals trained in the United States. A whole shipload of these vermin was sent from New York City under the command of a butcher named Lee Bronstein, who became famous under one of his many aliases, Leon Trotsky. This ship was intercepted by the British Navy and taken to Halifax, but a vigorous protest from President Wilson forced the British to release this shipment of human germs and escort it to Russia. The pressure on Wilson doubtlessly came from several sources, but the most important seems to have been a banker named Jacob Schiff, who has been the financial manager of Wilson's presidential campaign and whose banking house, Kuhn, Loeb and Company, has more than a year, had more than a year earlier deposited in Swedish banks $50 million in the name of Trotsky and another degenerate whose true name and early career have never been satisfactorily ascertained but who was known in history as Nikolai Lenin. In 1918, Felix Frankfurter was publicly denounced by former President Theodore Roosevelt as a soulmate of Lenin and Trotsky. He accordingly retired from the American government to a professorship in Harvard, where he settled down to train two generations of traders and slip them into positions of responsibility in Washington or into law schools throughout the nation. Alger Hiss was but one of hundreds whom Frankfurter prepared for their important tasks. 
I have mentioned these dates primarily to remind you of the great progress that the communist conspiracy made before 1919, when they decided to set up an official political party headed by William Z. Foster. This official party, the segment of the conspiracy that is openly displayed, has never been large. It probably never had over 90,000 card-carrying members at any one time. It has served on the one hand as a recruiting and testing agency to enlist talented conspirators who, after they have proven their worth and ability, could quietly be transferred to one or another division of the underground. And it has served on the other hand as a shield to mask and facilitate work on the part of the apparatus that consists of conspirators who's po who pose as liberal intellectuals and who urge the American people to save themselves from communism by reforming their legal and economic systems along communist lines at home and by taxing themselves to finance communist governments abroad. Now, these foreign events, although, of course, designated to weaken further our military position, are in the communist plans, strictly subordinate to the great program of internal subversion. This also has its center in Washington. Let me call your attention to one detail that you may not have noticed. We have all read about the president's so-called economy budget and the loud yammering in Congress for increased expenditures, which is, of course, primarily a means of making foolish Americans think that they have gained something if merely the crippling burden of that economy budget is dumped on their backs. Taxation has always been one of the primary instruments of the communist conspiracy. You may remember the famous remark that it is attributed to Harry Hopkins, and I don't know how accurate it is, but he said, we have to bleed the American pigs dry before we butcher them. But in this economy budget, one should note that the Department of Government was granted the largest increase, includes the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, which in this budget is granted a total outlay of $3,139,719,000, an increase of $1 billion over 1954. Now, this is the agency that is spending money to promote such things as fluoridation in public water supplies. So let's review that really quickly. They Their budget increased by a billion dollars over 1954. 3,139,719,000. And a lot of that money went to implement those infrastructures, including the fluoridation of water, which is a whole different story. And I'm sure you know what how it affects the pineal gland. By the way, you are here on the scene. It calcifies it. Okay, so by the way, you are here on the scene of one of the greatest triumphs, probably a triumph obtained by lavish expenditures from the federal treasury. The unfortunate people of Chicago were ordered by the little dictator in their city hall to drink water contaminated with sodium fluoride, and they are now drinking it and are not, are not even allowed to express their own opinion by a vote. The Department of Health, Education, and Welfare is also the agency that is currently promoting the communist scheme to enlist the services of well-meaning dupes under the guise of social good. The current agitation about mental health was begun by the World Health Organization, whose president was the ubiquitous, ubiquitous, ubiquitous traitor Alger Hiss. It is sponsored in the country by the National Association for Mental Health, whose director, Julius Schreiber, refused to tell a congressional committee whether or not he was a communist on the grounds that his answer might incriminate him. And there is a very sordid history in the history of mental health, too. Um, there is a book called The History of Psychology that it's pretty shocking. All right. But the greatest promotion is, of course, done with your money by the Department of Health, Education and Welfare. It is the one department observers in Washington estimate that 75 percent to 80 percent of the responsible officers are conspirators. I have said enough, I think, to suggest how desperate our situation is. Our ancestors were never confronted by a danger so terrible and so immediate. But I permit myself to see some hope, and the huge sale of the Overstreet book shows the American people who watched in a narcotic apathy induced by the press and the radio, while the communist conspiracy struck down the late Senator Joseph McCarthy, are at last becoming faintly aware of their danger. Some people everywhere have been made uneasy by such outrageous exhibitions of communist confidence as the use of paratroopers in Little Rock to overawe Americans who thought that they had constitutional rights. Protest is at last being heard against taxes that are imposed ostensibly for welfare and progress, but in reality merely to bleed dry what Hopkins calls the American pigs. Farmers are rejecting the bribes offered to them by the commissars and resenting government, 
governmental terrorism. Now, if you don't know what this means, I can remember my grandfather saying, um, even before I was born, um, I've, I heard the stories of before I was born, and the government used to bribe the farmers to set fire to their crop fields for crop regulation. So farmers are rejecting the bribes offered to them by the commissars and resenting government terrorism. And what is even more important on the local level, in many a community, people are becoming aware of the real purposes behind such things as regional planning, fluoridation, mental health, counseling programs, in the schools, and the many other local activities that serve the communist purpose of persuading the boobs to fasten on themselves with their own chains. I know of no more clear and concise program for the Americans than that which you set forth in the magnificent set of resolutions adopted last April by your Continental Congress. I may say that I first permit myself to hope when I read those resolutions in the pages of American Mercury, a magazine which, by the way, the communist conspiracy through its control of the distribution agencies has succeeded in barring from most of the nation's newsstands. So that was called American Mercury, and it was banned by the communists. Remember that the tentacles of the conspiracy reach into your hometown, where its puppets are promoting fluoridation, mental health, and innumerable other plans to accustom us to gradually increasing slavery and intimidation. On these issues also, you have in your resolution given Americans a program for action. Take that program and act by it on all matters, national or local. Make your voice heard. Each one of you belongs to a club or a social circle, so speak out and tell the Americans of this danger. I ask for your courage and resolution. You have displayed them as an organization, now display them as individuals in the community to which you belong. So remember, he was speaking to a group, to the National Convention of the Daughters of the American Revolution, and that is the organization in which he is addressing. So that concludes this pamphlet, and there's a lot in here that is relative to what's going on today, um, continues to build fluoridation, of course, Harvard and the like. All right. Thank you so much for joining me and have a great day.